My name is Michael Cregan. I'm a lecturer in electrical and electronic engineering. So the, my specialist area is in robotics. And in that little video that, that you watched, um, you actually would have seen a few of my, my robots from the Baxter robot that you see here to the little Rubik's Cube solving robot that one of my students built. So I'm going to, for the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to talk a little bit about electrical engineering and electronic engineering. So why study electrical and electronic engineering? Um, we live in a technological world. There's no getting away from it, from the mobile phones that we carry around in our pocket to the very web conferencing facilities that we're using here. Um, technology is everywhere. And as you grow older and as you move into the world of work, you will want to be educated and understand these technologies and be able to use them to the best of your ability. So in this technology world, we face certain global challenges. And I've listed a few of them here. We have climate change. And nearly every other night on the news, well, up until recently, we would have heard about climate change and the impact climate change has on us. We also face um, the issue of automation and robotics and how we phase that in. We also have the artificial intelligence and, and, and then wrapping them all together, cybersecurity. So if you're interested in any of these areas and you want to understand the technology and how these can have an impact on the world around us, then studying electrical and electronic engineering will give you a really good foothold in understanding these. I'm gonna mention a little bit about climate change because in climate change, some of my students have had significant impact. Whenever I first graduated from um, university 30 plus years ago, the, the world that we live in was powered by large fossil fuel or nuclear power stations, but th that has completely changed. In Northern Ireland alone, we um, have nearly 50% of our electricity is now generated from alternative or renewable sources such as wind turbines and solar panels. And many of my students who have gone on, who've graduated from our courses, have gone on to work for electricity utility companies and have worked um, to bring about this change so that the, um, the polluting fossil fuel power stations um, have much less impact compared to the much cleaner um, wind turbines and solar panels. And they've worked very hard. 30 years ago, we didn't think it was possible to run um, a grid with so little fossil fuel generation, um, but now that's possible. So what is the enabling technology? Well, I will argue from the, 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 the point that the enabling technology is a computing revolution. Um, we now have computers everywhere. And what's happening to these computers is, is that they're getting smaller, they're getting faster, and they're getting cheaper. And they're getting embedded into lots of different applications that we never thought possible. From the mobile phone that you carry around in your pocket to the, um, to the car that you drive. If any of you drive uh, quite a new car, you will be surprised how much automation there is in that car. Um, if any of you have actually had the um, the pleasure of driving a Tesla, some of the Teslas now, you know, you can enable um, self-driving where you can lift your hands on the steering wheel and you can let the car drive itself. Um, so the, what enables technologies like that are these tiny little microcontrollers. Now, I've shown you a picture of one of these little microcontrollers um, and they're very small. And what has happened is that the the, the processing power of computers has been reduced and shrunk down and enables these tiny little microcontrollers to be applied in certain circumstances. So one of the courses that I teach is embedded systems and in embedded systems, I teach my students how to program these little devices and then how to put them into different types of application, whether it's a robot, a robot to do a certain task. I've, I've already mentioned about the little Rubik's Cube solving robot. There, I, I got my student to program one of these little microcontrollers um, to read images from web cameras 
and then to control motors and that um, turned the different um, motors that that was able to solve the Rubik's Cube. So at Queen's University, we have three courses that I'm going to talk briefly about. The first course is electrical and electronic engineering. Sometimes we refer to that as a triple E course. Then we have software and electronic system engineering. That's referred to as SESE. And most recently, we have audio engineering. So the main course um, is electrical and electronic engineering. And I'm going to mention briefly, what is the difference between EEE and SESE? So say you're interested in electrical and electronic engineering. Well, then you'll have to decide which of these courses am I, am I going to, to study. Um, the EEE course has a large portion of it where we teach the students about electric power. So if you decided that you wanted to move into the electric power industry and work for the likes of National Grid, National Power, Northern Ireland Electricity, or in the Republic of Ireland, ESB, then you would be required to study um, the Triple E course. If, however, you were unsure and you were what area of engineering that you um, were interested in, um, and you were also interested in software and computer programming, then we have this hybrid course that that spans. Um, the engineering side of our school and our software and, and programming, our computer science side of the school. And that, that course is called Software and Electronic System Engineering. So in, the, in this course, the students learn about electronics and electrical engineering, but they also learn about software and computer programming. So in first year, the modules are split between the engineering and the computer science side of the house. And then as this course is developed, then the students get the opportunity to choose or focus on whichever aspect of the course that they most enjoy, whether that's engineering or where it's computer science. So those are the, the main courses that we um, have, and those are the courses that, that I teach on. So what is this course structure like? Um, like many of you at school, you will have probably focused, your courses will have focused on, on teaching, on, on lectures. Um, and that would have been the case at university many years ago. But universities, particularly engineering courses, um, are changing from being purely um, end of year examinations to a mixture of end of year examination and coursework. Um, and as Anna has already mentioned, um, project-based learning um, has a significant input into our, our assessments. So our assessments at the moment are roughly 60% examination, 40% coursework. So the examinations are our end of year exams and, our, and the 40% coursework comes from projects that the students do throughout the year. Um, and that is changing, you know, in light of our current situation with the pandemic, you know, I could well see that, that percentage almost flipping around where we maybe next year or in the year after, we will have 60% coursework and 40% end of year examination. We also have a peer mentoring scheme set up. A peer mentoring scheme is where we have first year students um, being helped by second year students who have just gone through the process. We then have, you know, second or sorry, third and final year students um, helping um, second and first year students. So that's a peer mentoring scheme that a lot of our students have benefited a lot from. Um, in the electrical engineering side of the house, our peer mentors meet usually one or two mornings a week. They meet for tea and coffee, and they, they then chat about the various course, course material that, um, that they have to do, and that's where the students get to help each other. So in addition to the, um, like the, the compulsory course structure. We also have extracurricular activities. Most of you are at school and your extracurricular activities at school may involve um, sport or choir or music. But we have certain extracurricular activities that are specifically focused um, around engineering and, and electrical, electronic and computer science. So one of them is the robotics club or robotics society. 
they meet um, again one evening a week, usually from 6.30 until about nine o'clock. And there they get to, to build robots of different types. Um, the society isn't limited to students from um, triple ECS, but it's actually from students from right across the university. Um, some can be from physics or even medicine and art um, and different aspects of the university. But the bulk of the students come from either engineering or computer science. So they meet w once, once a week. They get to build a variety of different robots. I normally go along and do several talks to the students throughout the, the year and, and help them wherever they need help. On a Wednesday afternoon in the Ashby building where I'm based, we run the electronics club. Again, this is two or three hours on a Wednesday afternoon where students can come along to the lab and they can get to work on their own projects. They get to use all the facilities of the university. Um, and they also get to, you know, to use the, the academics to tap on their know-how. You know, and sometimes it could, the students might be working on their own project. You know, it could be building a drone, it could be building a robot. It could be building an automation system for their home, or it could actually be some coursework that they need help with. Um, we also have a maker space, um, and that's used um, a lot by the Robotic Society. In the maker space, we have a variety of 3D printed machines and computers um, that the students can make use of. And most recently, we have also um, had some of some students help with Formula Student. Formula Student is where um, our engineering students build a single-seater race car, and then they take it off to England over the summertime, and they race it. And this year was the first year that that Formula student was changing from running a, a fossil fuel or petrol single-seater race car to actually running an electric-powered um, single-seater race car, and that's where I've got involved. So that's a little bit about, about our course structure. And here I've just chosen a few photographs that represent the type of work that our, our students do. Um, so hopefully, you know, if this is the type of work that appeals to you, then maybe you should consider some of our engineering courses or more specifically electrical and electronic engineering courses. So on the left, we have a little robot. So that robot is what I get my first year students to build. So in embedded systems, I teach the students how to program these little microcontrollers and then they use the microcontrollers to to read um, sensors from a um, that are built into the robot in this little robot here we have a variety of ultrasonic sensors so the student can program these sensors to read in um, values and then use those values to control the electric motors that govern where this robot moves and we actually get the students to build this robot and then use the robot to solve a maze. So that's a typical first year project. On the right hand side, we would have projects that are more focused towards final year. As I've already mentioned in the top right hand corner, we have Formula Student. This year we're moving from us, uh, our, our car from petrol to electric. And then in the bottom right hand corner, we have, that's one of my students, Kenny. And he's actually, what we did a few years ago, we took, we bought a, a DeLorean car. Um, DeLorean is the car that was featured in Back to the Future movies um, with Michael J. Fox. Um, we chose one of these cars because they were actually built in a factory not too far from Queen's University. So we bought in one of these cars and we converted it from being a petrol car to an electric car. And in that picture, you can see Kenny, is actually testing the electric motor. The electric motor is a yellow box on the right hand side of the picture and that's connected into the transmission. So you can see that's a much more significant, much more um, complex project and that a final year project student would be involved in. And that's the type of progression that the student um, will experience during their three or four years at Queen's University. Um, we also have a lot of scholarships. The reason why scholarships exist is that um, there is a shortage of engineers. 
And one of the ways companies um, get students or get more engineers, get the good engineers to come and work for them is that they provide scholarships. So they actually reach into the universities and they run a variety of scholarship programs. Um, I'm not going to go into any detail about them. I'm just going to mention very briefly the, the Power Academy Scholarship Scheme at the bottom. The Power Academy Scholarship Scheme, right across the UK, there is a shortage of electrical engineer that's focused on power. And the Power Academy was set up. And there, I think there's approximately nine universities across the UK that can offer scholarship schemes in the Power Academy. And in Ireland, you know, Queen's University is the only university that can offer scholarships. And those scholarships can, um, can amount to about £30,000 over the course of the three or four years that the student has at, at the university. Um, we think placement, and, and we encourage the, the students to go and work in placements usually between the second and third year at university. The, um, at Queen's University, we do have a dedicated placement team, um, both on the engineering and on the computer science side of um, our school. And really the placement is, uh, you know, I often talk about it's a soft entry to the, the world of work. Um, this, what the, stu the student actually gets the opportunity to go out and for nine or 10 months get gets to, to work in a job that's relevant um, to either computer science or engineering. And they get a good feel for the type of work that they might want to do whenever they, they graduate. This slide is just a typical um, overview of many of the employers that our students go to work for. You know, they vary from Jaguar Land Rover um, some of my students from last year, they're actually going and working for on autonomous vehicles for Jaguar and Land Rover um, to Northern Ireland Electricity in the top left-hand corner to Rolls-Royce and, and so on. So how do we stack up against other um, courses in the UK? Well, each year um, there are various league tables that come out. One of the uh, most respected league tables is the Times and Sunday Times Good University Guide. And they rank our triple E course as first in the UK for graduate job prospects. So that basically means that the students that graduate from our course have excellent job prospects. As I said earlier, there is a shortage of qualified engineers in the UK and globally. and the students that graduate from our course are highly respected. And that's why um, that's not just us saying it, but it's this independent group, the Times and Sunday Times Good University Guide. They say our students from Queen's University are first in the UK for job prospects. So that's on the teaching side. On the research side, we um, come eighth in the UK for research intensity. I'm going to finish on, on this slide. So while most of our students go and work as electrical electronic engineering, there is also on the engineering side, our students really do learn how to program. And a large percentage of our students also go on to work as computer programmers um, in a variety of companies. Some of our students really enjoy working at the university and they decide to stay on and do postgraduate or, or further research. Um, they may stay on to do a, a doctorate or a PhD in engineering. Because our courses are quite logical and structured, some of our students go on into management um, and management consultancy. And also because of the, the, the strong mathematical skills our students have, some, some of them go into finance. And then at the very bottom, some of our, our students go into teaching. So you can see from the skills from the skills that our students pick up on their course they they go into a variety of, of different types of jobs